nice over the top introduction, and I appreciate it. And as, as one of my mentors, Leah Atkins, would say, I guess it's time to put the hay down so the goats can get to it. Um, so I'm, I'm starting off today uh, with one of my favorite uh, historical characters, and that is William Bartram. And I'm going to read, so I'll stay on a, a track. And I hope this stays on track, too. Uh, I think William Bartram, as much as anyone, deserves the title of Alabama's first historian. His travels, which published in 1791, provides a multifaceted view of the region in the late 18th century because keep in mind, when William Bartram was writing, there was no Alabama. This was Creek country. Few, observe, few observers possessed keener eyes and greater description descriptive powers than Bartram. For generations, writers have celebrated William Bartram's southern journey to the natural places of the South, or as one author described it, his new green world. Not so. This morning, I would like to explore Bartram's surprising portrait of the late 18th century South, and I'd like to make three points today. First of all, Bartram was a historian and his world was a country manipulated and managed by people culturally distinct from Europeans. This was no wilderness, but in the jargon of the day, an artificial world shaped by humans. And it was not a new world, but an ancient world with a long past. And it was a turbulent place in the midst of dramatic change. Now, Bartram's travels, as many of you know, because we speak of Bartram frequently at, at the archives, uh, his travels took him from the leading ports of Britain's southern colonies through the extensive territories of the Creek and Cherokee Indians. Throughout his nearly 2,500-mile trek, his travels took him through not only uninhabited territory, but to sizable urban places, as well as smaller settlements and solitary habitations. The first major creek town he encountered when he crossed the Chattahoochee on his way to Mobile was the town of Uchi, which he hailed as the largest, most compact, and best situated Indian town I ever saw. Among the creeks, Bartram watched and listened intently as he enjoyed Indian hospitality. He wove descriptions of Indian places and practices into a chronological account of his journey. And he even constructed a second book, very unlike the first book, um, complete with a title page, and it's wo it, it, it comes out as part four of his travels, but the, the, the thing that carries the separate title page was specifically devoted to Indian culture and history and written in a very different style. Later in life, he would produce other writings on Native peoples, elaborating on key issues and addressing others uh, not fully covered in his published work. So, about this artificial world. As Bartram traveled through the towns of the southeastern Indians, he had ample opportunities to describe their characteristic architecture, which reflected cultural values as well as available building materials. His descriptions of the three central elements of the Creek Town, the square ground, the winter council house or rotunda, and the chunky yard, are among the most detailed from the 18th century. His accounts of architectural materials, interior design and decoration, are matched by equally detailed reports regarding the rituals of daily life that occurred in these places. Seldom in historic literature is it possible to find a more compelling description of an Indian ceremony than Bartram's measured cadence detailing the solemn drama of the black drink ceremony at the great council house at Atasi, that creek town not far from where we sit now. There, in a vast conical building or circular dome, as he put it, several hundred men could gather to smoke and take the ceremonial black drink. Bartram's exacting descriptions of the ceremonial lighting of the fire is as valuable to modern historians as his precise descriptions of his botanical finds uh, to modern biologists. And I challenge you, if you haven't read Travels Lately, to start uh, your journey in that council house. Now, the Creek Square ground, far from being a natural area, was a well-ordered arrangement of carefully delineated space that represented the spiritual cosmos of the Creek people. The space, as Bartram understood it, 
was sanctified and regulated by the customs of man out of respect for the forces of nature. Bartram questioned all those around him about Indians' religion, and he was a keen observer of their secular landscape, too. In his book, he described the many uses to which Indians put their lands, including hunting and gathering and subsistence activities, and of course, agriculture. While in their hunting territories, he noticed, as many others have, that Indians maintain an active, if not actual, occupation, laying names across the land, and he also found, of course, evidence of Indian paths and temporary habitations which dotted the woods. Bartram observed that the hunters manipulated their environment by burning in order to create browse for deer. In fact, to Bartram's eye, this practical management of the environment by Indian hunters, which kept forest open and, grassy, and made grassy fields inviting to deer, produced what he described as absolutely enchanting meadows that, as he put it, upon recovering from the burn, they, they recovered their vernal verdure and gaiety, would teem with wildlife. And he described these meadows as scenes of primitive nature, but they were far from natural. Instead, they were the result of centuries of environmental management by skilled native hunters. In short, if you read closely enough, Bartram's writings reveals that the extensive territories of Creeks and Cherokees and other Indians were purposefully shaped by native peoples who lived in complex and well-ordered urban societies. Bartram also realized that this was not a new world he traveled through. Everywhere he went, he encountered mounds and other handiwork of those he dubbed the ancients. Like others of his generation, Bartram was preoccupied with two central questions concerning the American Indian, their place of origin, and specifically whether or not Indians could conform to the civilized world being created or that had already been created by American settlers. Bartram, like other Christians, took it on faith that all people had descended from Adam and Eve. Thus, most believe that the Indians must have migrated from the old world, where, of course, the Garden of Eden was located, uh, to the new. And so information in Bartram's eye on ancient monuments uh, could provide a key to understanding the remote past of America's aboriginal inhabitants. Now, Bartram, in regards to this question, was very cautious in his approach. Unlike James Adair, for instance, who was convinced the Indians were the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. But Bartram avoided a forthright stand on the issue. Instead, he simply provided a descriptive catalog of Indian cultural and character traits and provided physical descriptions of them for comparative purposes and he concentrated on reporting these ancient remains, and travels is littered with accounts of mounds, stone grave boxes, shell middens, old fields, any evidence of what Bartram deemed distant antiquity. Marveling at these monuments of labor, ingenuity, and magnificence, Bartram decided that he could not see the least sign of arts, sciences, or architecture of Europeans or any other inhabitants of the old world. He couldn't figure out what they were. He just knew they were not uh, like anything else. Thus, even though he examined the issue of aboriginal origins, Bartram's ancients did not appear to have old world origins. But he could not definitively account uh, for their true origin. Modern scholars, taking the information from Bartram, as well as his contemporaries, and of course from the archaeological record, have been able to rebuild a complex early history of those we call Mississippians and link them to the modern Indians Bartram visited. In fact, we have two of the best at doing that on the program today, uh, Robbie and Greg. Um, Bartram himself clearly recognized the similarity between abandoned ancient mound sites and the town layouts of modern tribes. Modern scholarship, of course, has benefited tremendously from his work, as have museum people, and his work was one of the primary sources for the Model Creek Village in the museum upstairs, and I hope you will go and see it. Moreover, in his quest to discover their ancient origins, Bartram also collected Native American origin stories. 
The Creeks told him their ancestors had immigrated from the west beyond the Mississippi, which was their original native country. Unfortunately, Bartram and many others mistook such migration stories as a literal historic record, and he came to believe that the modern Indians he visited had first conquered and then appropriated the works of a now vanquished but evidently ancient people who had built many of the mounds that he saw. In time, such a view, called the Mound Builder Thesis eventually, would have devastating consequences for historic tribes when Americans began to assert that due to their conquest and displacement of earlier peoples, the uh, modern Indians did not possess legitimate claims to their homelands. As Bartram so well recounts, the Gulf South also had a history of conflict, movement, and transition. Throughout his travels, Bartram encountered places and heard stories of prior conflict, much of it from the very recent past. Particularly fresh in the memories of those he visited were tales of Creek Wars against the Spanish and their Florida Indian allies. At one point, uh, Bartram even thought he camped next to the border of an ancient burying ground where the Yamases, who had been slain by the Creeks in the last decisive battle of that war, lay buried. But he also saw abandoned fields and deserted town sites, and those provided solid testimony throughout his journey of migration and displacement, much of it due to warfare and the, as a result of European incursion. Now, by the time Bartram traveled through the South, of course, the French and Spanish had lost their holdings, but their attempts at permanence were still visible. Such disparate spots as old Fort Toulouse, where cannon left by the French still lay half buried, and Fort Picolata, built by the Spanish on the St. John's River, uh, which by Bartram's day was dismantled and deserted, testified to the military character of the European intrusion. Bartram could not ignore the strife a peaceful Quaker, he could not ignore the strife that was everywhere around him as Indians and colonists competed for the South. In Florida, he witnessed war parties he deemed a predatory band of Seminoles heading off to fight Choctaw Indians. The focus of both parties, Lower Creek Seminoles and Choctaw, was hunting territory which included part of the Tensaw Delta, a place Bartram would call the bloody fields of Scambia. On the Georgia border, Bartram traveled with surveyors to map the so-called New Purchase Session. This session, consist, consisting of some two million acres, uh, the land had originally belonged to the Cherokees, but Creeks had won it from them in the mid-18th century after a period of uh, prolonged war. Georgians, eager for land between uh, the Savannah and Oconee Rivers, made a deal with the Cherokees for this land in the early 1770s in exchange for cancellation of the Cherokee national debt. But the Creeks, now acknowledged owners of the land in question, were outraged. Bartram attempted the dip, uh, attended the diplomatic conference at which Cherokees, Creeks, and Georgians sorted this mess out. And Bartram alone is reporting the most humiliating lash, as he put it, that the Cherokees suffered in public when a Creek speaker, and I'm quoting, with an agitated and terrific countenance, frowning menaces and disdain, fixed his eyes on the Cherokee chiefs, asked them what right they had to give away Creek lands, and then called them old women. Well, that's a pretty bad insult. The deal was done eventually, but Georgians and Cherokees were forced to recognize Creek ownership of land soon to be settled by Georgians, and they had to pay the Creeks for it. The new purchase session is very interesting to me for a number of reasons. It's also a case study for environmental change as well as changing ownership. As Bartram traversed the territory with the survey crew following the session, he wrote with interest of the Buffalo Lick. This extraordinary place lay near a cane swamp and had years earlier been the resort of bison, but by Bartram's day, imported horned cattle and horses were the usual visitors. Bison, Bartram reported, had been affrighted away since the invasion by Europeans. 
Bartram's observations of the shifting species at this famous mineral lick is an example of how the South was vastly reshaped by the Columbian Exchange, as scholars call it. Alfred Crosby popularized the term to describe the mixing and mingling of European and American plants, animals, diseases, ideas, we could even extend that to human genes. Indeed, Europeans and Africans and their hogs, cattle, horses, insects, and crops and weeds had already begun to remake the South that Bartram visited. Evidence of environmental and cultural transformation confronted Bartram every step of his way. He extolled the charming orange groves that the Spanish had planted over large areas of Florida. He consumed figs from trees planted by the French settlers near Mobile. He feasted on Seminole watermelons, a fruit native to North Africa, but in Bartram's day already being spread across the South by Indian horticulturalists. Indeed, recall that war I mentioned between the Cherokees and the Creeks, whereby the Creeks obtained their claim to Cherokee lands along the Savannah River. At the conclusion of that war, Creek diplomats had diplomats had presented the Cherokees with watermelon seeds along with more traditional peace gifts uh, such as corn and conch shells to solidify their peace pact. And it's just such gift exchanges uh, that allowed crops to spread so rapidly. Bartram relished the peaches of the creeks whose landscape was already known by references to the fruit such as the standing peach tree village. The fruit trees were so widespread, he did not realize they were not native to the region, but rather took the old peach and plum orchards as evidence of long settlement. On the other hand, and this reveals his mindset, as he neared Fort Barrington on the Altamaha River, he encountered swamps and marshes, daily clearing and improving into fruitful rice plantations. Read that, improving into fruitful rice plantations, a value judgment uh, one can't escape. In the knees of native cypress trees, he and traveling companions found feral European uh, honeybees. Uh, they had long absconded from the hives established by the uh, Spanish around St. Augustine and along the Spanish road through Florida. Bartram remarked on the spread of honeymakers across the Florida panhandle, as well as the lucrative trade in honey and the sheer delight tra travelers took in finding a bee tree. Beehives were kept by settlers too, but the Indians simply hunted wild colonies and robbed them for home use and trade. In less than a generation, uh, feral bees would be well into what is now modern Alabama through this, this, this natural spreading. In an ironic twist, I think it's just, it's just an incredible uh, irony, Bartram was given a Muscogee name of Pug Puggy, which means flower hunter. The man who gave him that name was an Indian the English had named Cowkeeper. The Cowkeeper came by his English name honestly, for at his home in the Alachua Savannah, which is near modern Gainesville, uh, and he was a Muscogee, he was a, a member of the Creek Confederacy, uh, cowkeeper owned, as Bartram put it, innumerable droves of cattle. These were the offspring of herds and originally established by the Spanish and captured by the Indians. The Seminoles had won the cattle and territory from the Spanish after long years of war. Not only were there cattle on Alachua's Indian plains, but cow pens dotted the Carolina and Georgia frontiers of the creeks, and Bartram noted the cheering social lowings of domestic cattle herds wherever he went in that area. Near what would become modern Montgomery, a number of creeks were also acquiring cattle, and soon other creeks would be noted cow keepers as well. Cows provided meat and hides, as well as milk, butter, and very good cheese, according to Bartram. The new species of plants and animals not only brought environmental change, but brought new foodways to the South, combining with Indian cuisine and African uh, cuisine uh, to create what we know as uniquely Southern food. And as cattle keeping spread, large Largely free-range style, cows invaded cane breaks and began the destruction of perhaps one of the most remarkable landscape features of the early South. Bartram's descriptions of cane breaks varied from vast to troublesome, depending on whether he was botanizing or simply attempting to get around them, because, as he noted, there is no penetrating them without cutting a road. 
but mostly he was just impressed by these cane breaks um, and saw one near Mobile where the cane was 30 or 40 feet high, as thick as a man's arm, or three or four inches in diameter. That's a big cane. Had he traveled uh, through the south with Benjamin Hawkins a few years later, he would have found uh, shockingly a uh, few cane breaks. And horses, along with cattle, were responsible for that as well. And Bartram reported that both the Chickasaws and Lower Creeks had managed to develop specific breeds of uh, horses from a variety of Spanish horses. Bartram traveled the South on horseback and took the animal for granted as part of the everyday landscape. The vast caravans of trading ponies that traversed the landscape were part of a broader story of connection forged between native peoples and colonists through the deerskin trade. These traders who traveled from Carolina and Georgia also brought the biggest change of all via the new trading economy and intermarriage with native women. Bartram's guides and hosts, his informants in fact, for much of his journey were deerskin traders, Europeans. And he spent hours in their company, gleaning from them knowledge of the Indians and the landscapes they knew so well from their own travels. The manufactured goods these men carried in exchange for processed deer skin and other Indian produce transformed their Indian customers. Indian production of dressed hides for the exchange market was based on long hunting, uh, long standing hunting practices now taken to the extreme by the demands of the marketplace. Indians readily embraced the trade and appreciated at once the advantage of European weapons and textiles. And while Bartram may have dismissed as superfluities the silver ornaments, the ostrich feathers, and Chinese vermilion uh, used for war paint by his day, these items really did enrich Indian material culture. They provided a new means to display status and personal wealth. The acquisition and possession of guns, silver, jewelry, brightly colored glass beads, manufactured textiles and purchased shirts advertised success in the masculine art of the hunt. They enlivened Indian costume and they provided a means for artistic expression via fashionable self-presentment. And though all Indians felt the advantages of a steady supply of European trade goods, Bartram correctly laid out the exceeding high cost of the commerce. He noted the destruction of deer herds across the native south, an escalation of conflict between Indian tribes, conflicts with whites who encroached on Indian territory, and the introduction of debilitating liquor into the Indian nations. And he noted debt, overwhelming debt, as a result of a consumer economy uh, unable to keep up with the production side. Equally as important as the transformation wrought by new manufactured goods was the transformation of Indian social and family life as a result of friendship and marriage alliances with European traders. Many Indian men were adopting European attitudes and values towards property and wealth and were becoming traders themselves as, is test, uh, as Bartram's sketch uh, here testifies. You can see the warehouse in Georgia. He was rowed across a river by a creek man married to a white woman, as he tells us. But usually the match was reversed, with European and African men taking Indian wives. The offspring of these unions, which were lawful marriages under Indian custom, were called musties by the English, and that's the term Bartram uses. It's a corruption of the Spanish word mestizo. Racial distinctions were beginning to matter, but in the late 18th century, clan and lineage and town affiliation were still the hallmarks of Indian identity. The Indian women who married white traders supported the commercial interest of their husbands, for the most part, uh, although they insisted on raising their children according to Indian customs, usually. But the affection and interest of their fathers could not be denied and a new generation of Indians from culturally diverse backgrounds would, in a generation, become the leaders of their tribes. These bicultural men and women spoke many languages and were influenced by their fathers to accept and even take up the trading life, including its cultural values. One of uh, my favorite uh, traveling companions who accompanied William Bartram was a young, musty 
uh, Creek, as Bartram describes him, who traveled with Bartram from Mobile into the Creek town. And uh, here's another thing you should read in Travels, one of my favorite parts, how to construct a raft to get across the Alabama River at flood stage, uh, which the Musty Creek uh, taught Bartram. But this young man's background is incredible. His mother was a Choctaw woman. She was a captive who had been enslaved by the Creeks during a war between the Creeks and Choctaws, enslaved and kept among the Creeks. And she had married, or... A, a, a Creek man. His father was the product of a marriage between a Creek woman and a deerskin trader. Now, Bartram attended the youth's wedding when they reached the Creek town of Mucolossus, and the young man's bride was the daughter of the head man of the town, and her, his, her sister was the uh, wife of the resident British trader. Now, unpack all those complex relationships. Enslaved Choctaw woman, British trader, Creek Headman, Young Musty Creek, who has in his veins these, this variety of backgrounds, and, a, and Creek, Creek women are all in this. In that young couple, Bartram had visual proof of the strength of kinship traditions as well as the importance of trade connections. He also saw before his eyes the mixing of cultures and destinies as a result of territorial wars and the quest for trade goods, as well as the impact of new material goods and ideas had wrought on the native South. So this, then, is the world to which Bartram traveled and allows us to see today in all its glory. And, and I, I didn't have time to talk about it, but he provides not only visual pictures with his words, but he enlivens us with tales of how this world sounded, even how it smells when he catched hold of a plant that was an allspice. And, and he describes the aromas, the sounds, the feelings of this late 18th century world. He chronicled it very well. And he provides in his work an amazing historical portrait of our region before statehood. By the late 18th century, Far from a wilderness, it was an artificial world of towns and villages shaped by Indian peoples. It was a world of complex cultures with rich cosmologies and rituals and social organization. It was a world that had an ancient history of fallen empires, of conflict and contact, of trade and commerce, of migration and movement, of destruction and regeneration. And most importantly, and in conclusion, it was a world in transition. Changed, yes, but still changing as new plants and animals made their way across the landscape. It was a culturally and ethnically diverse world where new ideas and new connections were quite literally producing new kinds of people who traveled the ancient paths along with William Bartram, just as those caravans of pack horses beat Indian paths into commercial thoroughfares that would eventually become American roads. Thank you.